Welcome to the Good Chris Sophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. For the podcast this week, we're listening to a talk that was given by Brother Matt Davies in 2016, talking about the biblical nation of Tarshish and the role that it plays in the latter days of biblical times. This class was given right after Brexit had originally been voted on by the United Kingdom, and I thought it would be relevant to share this class as the deadline for the United Kingdom to officially partake in Brexit and leave the European Union passed at the end of January. Now, I know for some people, taking a listen to prophecy classes like this can both be encouraging and discouraging based on the fact that we do not fully understand nor know all the events that are going to take place before the return of Christ. However, Brother Matt in his classes is looking specifically at the evidence that's supporting the United Kingdom to be Tarshish and also taking a look at the role that Tarshish will play in the latter days that are outlined in Ezekiel 38. I found it to be a really thorough and well laid out class looking at that evidence with the things going on in the news right now with Brexit was an encouraging one to listen to. At the very beginning of his class, he makes the claim that this could be the last great sign that we will see. I don't know if I fully agree with that kind of hyperbolic statement at the beginning of it, but I did think that overall the idea of this is it might be one of the most visible signs of God working in the world around us since maybe the formation of Israel, um, which was before I was alive. But I know from talking to some of the older brothers and sisters that were alive at that time how exciting and encouraging it was to see Israel reformed as a nation. This is the first time in the last 50 years that the stage in the world matches what's outlined in Ezekiel 38, which is setting the stage for those latter days just before the Gogian Confederacy was to invade Israel. There's still other things that may be put in place still before the return of Christ, but it's exciting to see things in the world that seem to be aligning with that glorious day coming soon. I thought it was a really interesting class to listen to, looking at all the archaeological evidence that Brother Matt gets into talking about the evidence that allows us to sort of confidently say that the nation of Tarshish that's mentioned in the scriptures does align with the United Kingdom and all the other nations that respond from the British Empire uh, back in history. As always, if you have any suggestions for classes, please feel free to send them in. Uh, We have gotten a number of uh, really interesting ones that we're in the process of listening through and really enjoying it. So if you have any other recommendations or classes, uh, please feel free to send them in. Uh, They're always very much appreciated. Hopefully you enjoy this class, and I will now turn it over to Brother Matt Davies for his class on the biblical role of Tarshish in the latter days. We have witnessed, perhaps, what is going to be the last great sign to our generation, brothers and sisters. I truly believe that. We have witnessed on the 23rd of June, the British public, voting to separate themselves from the European Union. Brexit has taken place. How many prophecy days have we been to, brothers and sisters, where the speaker dealing with the subject of Tarshish has said, do you know what? We're expecting that one day Britain is going to separate from Europe. And now, brothers and sisters, we are here. We are at that day. It's happened. It's history. It's past. We've had words like earthquake. We've got a new cabinet, a new prime minister. Things have completely and dramatically changed on the world scene. Against all the odds, brothers and sisters, this has happened. And you know, it shouldn't really have come as a surprise to us, should it, brothers and sisters? Our pioneer brethren, going right back in time, have written down for us, by their understanding of Bible prophecy, that these things would take place. And even in recent times, even when Britain joined the EEC as it was on the t- at the time, although that was confusing to some of us, we have seen brethren, for example, here's Graham Pierce. He said there in 1981, though we do not know how it will happen, Britain will separate from Europe. Our brother Paul Bill- Billington, 
Britain's exit from Europe is inevitable in 1990. Brother John, who's here today, in 1998, Britain has no part in this power of Europe. And again, from the Bible magazine, 2007, we have the same thing. Brothers and sisters, wow, it happened. But that doesn't prove anything, does it? doesn't prove anything. And we do have those ideas that are floating around. We're a bit confused still in some places. Tarshish can be any trading nation. Tarshish is Spain, we're hearing. Tarshish is Turkey, we're hearing. You can never know, so why bother looking? Why are you crazy people getting excited about Brexit? Brothers and sisters, if we haven't taken the time to read back over some of those old pioneer publications, if we haven't taken the time to read some of those things in the Bible magazine and elsewhere, I suggest that we do so because we are missing out if we don't appreciate what has just happened to this country. What we'd like to do today, with the small amount of time that we've got together, God willing, is to open our Bibles and try and give you a bit of a flavour on why it is reasonable to believe that when we read Tarshish in our scriptures, we read, we are actually reading of the ancient power of Britain, this country that we are strangers and pilgrims in. And then we want to have a consideration about, about what are the implications of that. If we conclude that it is reasonable that Tarshish is Britain, what does that mean to us? And what should that mean to you and me as we live our daily lives in 2016? So that's what we hope to do. Now, we've got a lot to get through, so I hope you've got your seatbelts on. We've got there on the screen, there are 28 times that Tarshish is mentioned in Scripture in 24 verses. Now, you will be pleased to know I'm not going to be going through all 28 of you, because what we can do is separate those 28 uh, mentions of Tarshish into different buckets, as it were. So we've got a load of historical references to Tarshish on the left-hand side. Tarshish is mentioned as a real person, it's a name of a person, and so we've got some references there to, to a named person called Tarshish. And then as we go on, from, we get, can enter into the time of the kings around 900 uh, BC, we find that, that Tarshish is, is no longer a single person, but it's become a nation, a people, and they're famous for, for various things. And when we continue on into the time of Ezekiel around 600 BC, we find again that there's this people called Tarshish that are doing various things at that time. And if that's all it was, well, then perhaps we wouldn't really be thinking much about Tarshish anymore. We think of them as one of those ancient places that are pretty much insignificant, dying in the midst of time, as it were, uh, a blank. But no, because we have prophetical references to this power of Tarshish, which make it relevant to us, brothers and sisters, and young people and friends in our days. Because we have references to do with a prophecy around Tyre, and various prophecies around ancient Tyre. We're going to have a quick look at that in, in, in a bit. We've just read um, with, uh, with Brother David, we've just read the um, account in Ezekiel chapter 38 of the latter days, and we'll have a glance at that. And Tarshish is alive and well in the latter days. And finally, brothers and sisters, if we get time, I hope we do, we'll have a quick look at some of the prophecies about the power of Tarshish in the kingdom age after our Lord Jesus Christ has returned to the earth. No, God has a purpose with this power of Tarshish. We can't treat it lightly, brothers and sisters. I don't think it's good enough to say, well, it's too complicated, we can't be bothered. Really, I think it's, God's given us a lot of information to digest around Tarshish. It's his holy word, his inspired and infallible word. And it is our duty, isn't it? It is our honour to search these things out, to see, to try and understand what he has revealed about these things. So, let's begin. The first thing I would like to point out is um, that whoever Tarshish is, they are a descendant of Japheth. If you've got your Bibles, let's look open to Genesis and chapter 10. In Genesis chapter 10, of course, you'll know 
This is the um, account of the descendants of Noah. And we know this chapter as the table of nations because from all of these descendants, we understand that humanity has descended from. So in Genesis chapter 10, you'll see in verse 1, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were, the, were sons born after the flood. And then we get, um, in verses 2 through 5, the sons of Japheth. And if you glance down and look at verse 4, and the sons of Javan, Elishua, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. So this is the first time we come across Tarshish. It's a person. It's a descendant of Noah through Japheth. Now, what's interesting about that, brothers and sisters, is that Josephus records to us the migration pattern of the sons of Noah. And he explains in his works that the sons of Japheth, they emigrated into the European territories. And so what we are looking to glean from this is that wherever Tarshish is, you know, we're going to expect to find them in the European part of the world. We're not going to expect to find them in China or Japan, really, or down in Africa, because they're Japhethites. And so we look for them within that region of Europe, the Isles of the Gentiles, as we have read there in verse 5. So that's clue number one. It's from Japheth, probably a European power. As we say, as we go forward then in time from Genesis, we find that Tarshish is no longer a single person, a single character. He's had descendants of his own. He's now established, as it were, a power, all of its own rights, a nation famous for its maritime adventures. We come across the ships of Tarshish all over the place, all over Scripture, mainly at the time of the kings and in the time of Ezekiel. So whoever Tarshish is, around 900 BC, that's in academic terms, the Bronze Age, whoever Tarshish is, they're going to have established very good maritime skills because we come across them trading in this and that, traveling here, traveling there, at the time of the kings. And so there are proud maritime histories stretching back into that Bronze Age. Now, the problem with the Bronze Age is that history wasn't being written in the Bronze Age. So it's not like we can just hop on the internet and uh, find some accounts and blogs or something of somebody who was around in the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age was prehistory. We can't even find very easily manuscripts and documents from that time. It's, they've all disintegrated long, long ago. And so we have to... You know, we're going to have to try and piece a few things together in a minute to see what this power of Tarshish might have been. Now, there's another one. I'd like us to turn over to two chronicles. Let's go to now to the time of King Solomon. Because Tarshish, as we say, is established at this time as a maritime power at the time of Solomon. So we're going to go to two chronicles and chapter 9, please. And we see that the Tarshish power was absolutely essential, brothers and sisters, in making Solomon one of the richest powers of the ancient world. And we're told that in 2 Chronicles chapter 9. They helped Solomon, you see, train in global markets. So 2 Chronicles chapter 9, and if you look at verse 20, we read there of the great wealth of Solomon. It says, and all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold, none were of silver. It was not anything accounted of in the days of Solomon. Why? Why was it like nothing if everything was gold? We're told in verse 21, for the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Every three years once came the ships of Tarshish bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Now, there's a suggestion here. Because what we have is we have a trade deal, don't we, between Hiram, Solomon, and these ships of Tarshish. 
So first of all, well, who was Hiram? Well, Hiram was the king of Tyre. Where was Tyre? Tyre is to the north of Israel in modern-day Lebanon. It was the great um, emporium, I think they called it, of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were kind of a maritime trading um, nation. They set up um, outposts all over the place. We'll have a look at those in, in a minute. And Hiram was their king in Tyre to the north of Israel. And Hiram, of course, he got, got on very well with David and Solomon. He helped even contribute to the temple, didn't he? In Amos, it says that he had a brotherly covenant with Israel and with the God of Israel, it seems. I, I believe, personally, he, he was a believer in Yahweh, in the God of Israel. Anyway, here, he decides to go into business, so as it were, with King Solomon. Now, we're told in 2 Chronicles 8, we've not got time to, too much time to spend on this, but in 2 Chronicles 8, we're told that Solomon specifically builds a port in Ezion Geba, which is to the south of Israel down there, in modern-day Elat. And so we've got to ask ourselves the question, well, well, what is this trade deal all about? Why did this trade deal make Solomon so um, rich? Well, I've got a suggestion to make. And that is that what this deal did is that it connected for the Phoenicians the West and the East together. That's what it did. It allowed them to trade in the West and bring commodities from there across to the East and vice versa. And in the middle was the land of Solomon, who Hiram used to kind of transfer, possibly, some of those goods across. Now, you might think that's a, that's a bit strange, don't you think? That's a bit of an assumption. Well... I haven't got it on the screen, but recently in Tel Dor, which is just south of Tyre, they found some Phoenician vases in an ancient port, an ancient Phoenician port. And in those vases, they found traces of cinnamon from the Bronze Age. And cinnamon comes from India. And so it's amazing that we've got these trade routes happening. Why, why is it that Indian spices are up there across the land in Tyre? They were doing a lot of business, brothers and sisters. And it's interesting that it says every three years these ships came. Don't you think that's peculiar? I'll tell you why that's peculiar, because it doesn't take three years to get from Ezion Geba down to, say, India, where we read um, most probably the, the apes and the peacocks were coming from that was part of this trade deal. It doesn't take three years to get to India and back. It takes half a year. So we've got all these questions. And, and, and there's one other quick thing, another piece of the puzzle, uh, which is later in time, we come across another king, King Jehoshaphat. And this is at the time when the, the kingdom of Israel had, had broken up. So we have the southern kingdom um, in, in, in Judah. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. And he does a deal with Amaziah, who is the king of, of, um, of Israel in the north. And we're told in 2 Chronicles 20 that God curses this, this deal. But one of the things that um, Jehoshaphat wanted to do was to build ships in Ezion Geba, to go to Tarshish. And I think he was trying to recreate this great wealth that Solomon had basically got. Now, why is all this relevant? That's what you're thinking to this clue. Um, well, first of all, it shows that, that wherever Tarshish was, they traded across the east and the west. But there's another thing um, to bear in mind. Some people have considered that because the ships of Tarshish left from Ezion Geba down here, um, and they went uh, down in, and traded in things like peacocks and apes, that perhaps that suggests that Tarshish was in the east, that there was an eastern Tarshish. I know Brother Thomas believed that. But I wonder whether or not this here, this clue here from Herodotus is of interest and import. Because we read from Herodotus that a king of Egypt, Nico, sent out a fleet manned by a Phoenician crew. The Phoenicians sailed from the Arabian Gulf into the Southern Ocean, and after two full years, they rounded the Pillars of Hercules, that's by Spain, in the course of the third, they returned to Egypt. And Herodotus lived about 100, well, he died about 150 years after Ezekiel. So what that means, brothers and sisters, is that we don't necessarily have to look for Tarshish in the east because the Phoenicians, according to Herodotus, were circumnavigating Africa. And so wherever Tarshish was, you could actually get to it you know, either way, it's not, a, it's not a solid clue, in my view, as to where Tarshish is. It definitely has connections to the east, but Tarshish could be in any part of that trade route. And if you're just thinking, ah, oh, come 
on that. You're crazy. They, they, those ancient people, they were stupid. How could they get a boat to go around Africa? Well, some crazy person, I think his name was um, Philip Beale, he started a thing called the Phoenician Ship Expedition. I don't know if you came across that in the news. He actually sailed into London. And he built this boat with his team um, using ancient techniques as it, and modeling it on ancient kind of Phoenician um, ship models. And he actually did this trip. So you can look up the, the Phoenician um, ship expedition. You can see that, that it was possible with the ancient kind of sailing um, uh, and, and kind of tools that they had in those days. It is a thing, brothers and sisters. So the clue we're looking for there is, is that Tarshish traded in the east and the west. I'm not so sure we have to look for it in the west. And the reason I'm definitely sure that Tarshish wasn't in the east was because of this clue when we come to the time of Jonah. You remember Jonah? He wants to flee. He doesn't want to go and, and preach the truth um, to the Ninevites. And so we're told twice in the prophecy of Jonah what his plans were to get out of this situation. Jonah chapter 1, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. And then later he recounts this and he says, look, I wanted to run away and I wanted to get to Tarshish. So he goes to Joppa to get to Tarshish. Now, if you're fleeing somewhere, you're going to try, you're, you're trying to flee as fast as you possibly can. That's the whole um, idea of running away, isn't it? Fleeing. Well, where's Joppa? Well, Joppa is on the western side of Israel. It's modern-day Jaffa. And so wherever Tarshish is, if you want to get there quickly, you need to go west. That's what we're being told by Jonah. And here's another extra-biblical clue. This is King Esar Haddon writing around 670 BC. And I was excited when I came across this. Because he says, all the kings from the lands surrounded by sea, from the country Ladanana, Cyprus, and Laman, the Ionian Islands, as far as Tarshish bound my feet. So this is a king living around the same time as Ezekiel, okay, and he says, he tells us three, three really exciting things. Firstly, did you notice that he's referencing kings that were surrounded by sea? So wherever Tarshish is, according to Esar Haddon, it was an island town. Secondly, he is, is looking at these things from um, east to west. Because if you look at how his mind is thinking, he's going from Cyprus to the Ionian Islands, and then he's ending up at Tarshish. And so it seems Tarshish is in the west, if you follow his, his train of thought. And, and you would think he would know, wouldn't you, brothers and sisters? Because he lived in those days. And so this power of Tarshish, I would say to you, based on this evidence and scripture evidence, we can't say, oh, we're never sure. It just could be any trading nation. It could be anybody who's happening to trade. Not according to S.R. Adam. S.R. Adam says, no, this was a real power in the West that bowed to my feet. And as I say, he'd know, wouldn't he? When Jonah got on the boat to go to Tarshish, do you think he was just kind of paid his ticket and just take me anywhere there's a trading nation? And just, you know, you know, Timbuktu, so to speak. I don't think so, brothers and sisters. He determined in his mind to go to Tarshish. It was the furthest point away that he knew about. And off he went. Clue number five. I've got to hurry up. I get excited. And we, uh, we lose time. Can we turn over to Ezekiel chapter 27, please? As I say, time of Ezekiel now, a couple of hundred years off from the time of Solomon. And Ezekiel has some prophecies around the power of Tyre. Now remember Tyre was that power that Hiram was the king over. And as I mentioned, there was very close connections between the Phoenician power of Tyre and Solomon and the things of God. And as time went on, as we know from our studies, the Tyrians, they forgot God. And in fact, eventually, they eventually scorned the people of Israel. And so for those reasons, we read prophecies such as this in Ezekiel chapter 27. These are, these are prophecies against Tyre, of the doom of the great city. So we read in verse 2, Now thou, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus, and say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, 
which are to merchants of the people for many islands. Thus saith the God I am, O Titus, thou hast said, I am of perfect peace. Thy borders are in the midst of the seas, thy builders have perfected thy beauty, they have made all thy sh shipboards or fir trees, and it goes on praising how wonderful Tyre is, it goes through all the different wonderful things that Tyre had done, and then at the end of the chapter, we find that all, all of those wonderful things, because of the pride of the people, was going to come to an end, because they had forgotten the God of Israel. But inside this prophecy, we get some interesting clues again to who Tarshish is. Tarshish is there in verse 12, if you have a look. It says, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches, with silver, iron, tin, and lead. They traded in thy fairs. And in verse 25 we read that the ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. So there's this great connection, you see, between the Phoenician power of Tyre and Tarshish. And Tarshish came and traded certain things at Tyre, silver, iron, tin, and lead. Now, that's very interesting. As we say, the Phoenicians they had a great network, and, and stuff's been discovered all over the place, with Phoenician inscriptions, North Africa, particularly around the Mediterranean. Um, there's accounts of them going down to South, uh, Western Africa. There's, they're all over, uh, there's parts of them in, in, in the East as well. Bear in mind it's prehistory, it's great that we've got some of those things. But what's interesting about this is that we get mentioned non-Phoenician colonies here who are coming to trade at Tyre. And they're bringing various things to Tyre. And Tarshish is bringing these metals. There's other ones. So for example, if you look at verse 21, um, Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, they occupied with thee in lands and rams and goats. Verse 22, we read of Sheba and Rama, and they come with all precious stones and gold and spices. So you get the idea. These are powers bringing um, commodities native to their lands to tie to trade. That's what it seems to be implying. So wherever Tarshish is then, it's going to be found in a place where there is silver, iron, tin, and lead. That's what we're being told, brothers and sisters, from this. And again, we're told it must be a real place. You know, you can't have here um, Tyre being some fanciful kind of fairy tale place where we're not really sure where it is, and then straight away next read of Damascus, which we know exactly where it is. These, it makes no sense to treat God's word like, like, like some seems to be doing in this regard. Tarshish was a real place, brothers and sisters. Known for its metals, here's in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 10, silver from Tarshish. Extra biblical quote here. This is a receipt, the oldest mention of the, um, the house of Yahweh, and a receipt around silver from Tarshish is mentioned on it, and this, this ostracon. So, wherever Tarshish is, silver, iron, tin, and lead will be there. There's another prophecy, we, we haven't got time to go there, in Isaiah chapter 23 which talks about Tyre, and it says Tyre is going, to be, is going to be destroyed, and as part of that prophecy, we read that the Tyrians would pass over to Tarshish, and it, that, that they would go afar off from Sodom when Tyre had been destroyed. So another clue is then, wherever Tarshish is, it seems that the power of Tyre would be transferred to Tarshish. They would be, as it were, the latter-day Tyre, after Tyre had fallen. And then we come to our day and age, to Ezekiel chapter 38. So we turn there, brothers and sisters, because this is where it gets very, very relevant to us, because it's all well and good looking back in time at history, and we are going, we're not through it yet, so I'm sorry if you find history dry, because we're going to have a little bit more, but it's all well and good looking back at history, but what does it mean today? And Ezekiel 38, if ever there was a chapter about today, it would be Ezekiel 38, wouldn't it? Why do we say such things? Well, because Ezekiel 38 is about the time period called the latter days, in verse 8, and it's also mentioned there in verse 16. Two times mentioned, in case we weren't paying attention. The latter days. Why is that important? Well, because when you follow that thread through the whole of Scripture, the latter days is always a reference to the time when the Jews have been regathered to their land, which we've seen. 
Now, shortly, um, Brother Mike and Brother Simeon are going to be taking us into Daniel. And we're going to be looking at the time of the end, which is another biblical phrase that we come across. And for your notes, just drop down Daniel chapter 10, verse 14. I don't know if the other speakers will go to it, because in Daniel 10, verse 14, the angel comes to Daniel and says, I'm going to share with you what's going to happen in the latter days. And then we get Daniel chapter 11, and at the end of Daniel chapter 11, we get the phrase, and at the time of the end. And so it is my belief that the phrase, the latter years, the latter days, is the same as the time of the end. And so Tarshish at the time of the end is our subject today. And what do we find Tarshish doing at this time of the end? Well, we read of them in verse 13. But before we get there, just to, re- just to kind of force the issue home, this is our time. Israel have been restored. There is controversy, as the chapter says, on the, the mountains of Israel with the West Bank settlements. And indeed, we read that Gog, this mysterious invader from the north, who comes against Israel in Ezekiel 38, in the latter days, comes against a wealthy Israel in verse 12, that we gathered against all the nations. And we've seen the rise of Israel. We've seen their economic power growing, their technology. We've seen the gas fines. They're there. All the pieces of the puzzle are pretty much in place for this to unfold. Just another couple of things before we move on. I've I've got to do this. Because we read of these ancient invading forces from verses 1 through 7. And these invading forces come against Israel in the latter days. We read some strange things, don't we? We read about this character called Gog in verse 2. He's the leader of this invading force. And we read that he's from the land of Mago. I just want to spend a couple of seconds just looking at who the land or where the land of Mago actually is. Well, Josephus tells us that the people of Mago were called the Scythians by the Greeks. And so we've got to go back to the Greeks to figure out, well, where were the Scythians then? And Herodotus, the father of history, is the first historian around 450 BC. He records eight key rivers that ran through the territory of Scythia. And we can find some of those those rivers. Basically, brothers and sisters, plotting the two extreme ones on the map, we've got the the river Danube and the river Don. We have the land of Scythia there before us. So we have the land of Mago that comes up there on the screen. Central and Eastern Europe. And this is where Go, he, he comes from, this area, and he seems to be leading these people forward. There's another group of people, isn't there, mentioned, in verse, well, verse 5, we have some very familiar to us, Persia and Ethiopia and Libya. But then in verse 6, I just want to hone in on this one, Goma. Goma pops up. Again, Her- um, Josephus tells us that the Greeks called the Goma people Galatians. So we go back to the Greeks, uh, well, the time of the Romans, actually, and we find that um, this guy, Galates, he founded the Gauls. And the Gauls, I don't know if you're like me when you're growing up, I was a big fan of Asterix the Gaul with his magic potion. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. But Asterix the Gaul, as we all know, was um, from France. The Franks came from the ancient Gauls. So we, he sees things together. Now there's more nations, and I'm sure the other speakers are going to add a few more to this map. But the reason why I'm putting this up is, brothers and sisters, because these are the peoples of the European nations indicated out in these prophecies. And these peoples, at the time of the end, are against Israel. But then we have this other power block that we've mentioned in verse 30. We have Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lines thereof. They challenge this invading force. They say there in verse 13, they say, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? So first off, well, where is Sheba and Dedan? Well, we can trace them back to this area here in the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia and South Yemen, Yemen and the United Arab Emirates and all those Gulf states down there. And once we've done that, we can see that there are these two power bases forming. As I say, there's the northern invader, Gog, and we put 
Only two of those nations on the screen, more will follow, I'm sure. And these European powers are separate politically, militarily, and economically from Sheba and Nidam, who are in that area there, and the merchants of Tarshish. So in the latter days, Tarshish, whoever they are, in our day, we should be seeing this Tarshish power starting to connect its trade with the Gulf states. That's the point. And it's not going to be with the European powers in Central and, and Eastern and Western Europe over there. It's going to be different. It's going to have a different course of action. The final clue that we read of, actually there in Ezekiel 38, is that whoever Tarshish is, it has young lions with it. That's a really strange thing, isn't it? Because we're reading here of political powers, and suddenly in the midst of referencing these political powers and these trading merchants of Tarshish, we read of some young lions that come out of Tarshish. Now, I don't know what you think, brothers and sisters, but I don't think this is referencing literal lions to you, because the context is political powers. So how do we understand these lions then? Well, we haven't got time, but Ezekiel 19 tells us how that lions basically progress. They start off as whelps, which are dependent on their mother, and as they get older, they eventually leave the pride, they catch their own prey, they become independent of the mother lion. And so, although they're from the mother lion, they are independent powers in their own right. And so we take that context and we apply it to the political context of Ezekiel chapter 38, and suddenly we realise that what we're being told here is that whoever Tarshish is, where, wherever it might be, there are political lions that have come out of it, so to speak, independent political powers in their own rights. And so that's what we understand. It's a colonial power in the latter days. So, just to recap, it's a descendant of Tarshish. Oh, it's a descendant of Tarshish. It's a maritime power. It traded in global markets. It's located to the west. It's a source of silver, iron, tin, and lead, and it traded with Tyre. It takes over from Tyre. It's a trading power in the Gulf, and it's a colonial power. Now, we're going to whiz through this, because the question is, is, is it reasonable that Britain fits with these clues that we've gleaned from Scripture? Is there any other power that fits with these things? Well, let's, let's just go through them steadily. So we've got, well, of course, a descendant of Japheth, and so it fits that indication there in the European areas. What about the next two? An ancient maritime power and traded in global markets. Well, as I say, it's tricky because we're talking about the Bronze Age. It's very difficult to get hold of material um, and evidence from that far back. But it just so happens that in 1992, these, uh, they were digging a road between Folkestone, I think, and Dover, the A20. Driving down that one day, and they found this boat, um, which is on display in the Dover Museum. It's the oldest seagoing boat ever discovered from the Bronze Age, 300, uh, sorry, 3000 BC, uh, sorry, 1000 BC, 3000 years ago. I think it's fitting, isn't it, that, that the most ancient seagoing ship has been found in Britain. If we're looking for an indication of of who Britain is, well, there's a little little clue of who Tarshish is. There's a little clue. Amazing that they found this this boat. It's only there's only twenty Bronze Age boats on the planet, and uh, and this one is 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 very very rare. And there it is in Britain. They found other boats and shipwrecks around Britain from the Bronze Age, which, according to this article in the Telegraph, show that that trade was thriving off the coast of Britain three thousand years ago. That one's in Southam and Devon. What about connections with the Mediterranean? You know, the, you, you often sometimes meet people, ah, Britain, you're crazy, Matt, you're crazy. There's no way there's connections with, with the Mediterranean. Really? Well, look at this. This is Carthage, which was a Phoenician city, and they found a coin from Carthage in Britain. 2,300-year-old um, coin. What's a coin from Phoenician Carthage doing in Britain if there was no trade going on, brothers and sisters and young people? The experts here in this, in this article conclude that there was a lot of trade. What about this guy? They found a, a small boy, Stonehenge, unfortunately, obviously dead. They dug him up. 
and they did some tests on him and they found he was 3,000 years old. And that, in fact, he came from the Mediterranean. Isn't that interesting? Now we've got evidence of peoples moving across. And by the way, skeletons from that time are incredibly rare. So it's amazing they found one in the first place. Then to find one that's from the Mediterranean, wow, that's even, even better. So I think, and there's just, that's just a few bits of evidence I can carry on boy or silly with, uh, with ancient things that we found. But there's a couple to whet your appetite. I think we can say there is evidence of ancient trade and maritime prowess off of the coast of Britain. Clue number four was it's to the west, well, obviously, um, that one fits the bill. If you wanted to get to Britain by boat as quick as possible from Israel, you would leave from somewhere like Joppa. What about clue number five, a source of silver, iron, tin, and lead? Now, this one, this one is, for me, the clincher. You know, all of these individually, you can, you can pull apart a little bit, but when you see all of them together and you add this one to the mix, it's, it's pretty solid. I mean, I don't think there's any other power that could fit these clues. These are very, very rare to find altogether. And even rarer is tin, as we will find. Now, are these in Britain? Well, yes, they are, brothers and sisters, young people, and friends. Um, I always tell this story, so sorry if you've heard it too many times, but I do find it amusing. Because I bored my wife silly one time when we were on holiday in Derbyshire, and I happened to go past the Peak District Mining Museum. And I spent the afternoon taking photos of rocks. She thought I'd gone crazy. But in all of my photographs, there were these. These were the rocks um, that you can get silver, iron, tin, and lead from. And if you're thinking, well, why is there only three? Well, because you can get lead and silver from Galena on the right-hand side. Wow. And we're in Wales, aren't we? And uh, this is uh, from, a, from a book um, on the uh, ancient um, industrial mining that goes back to the Romans. And so it's hard to go back further than that. But look at the, the Welsh mines. Before you're thinking, well, what do you know about Wales? Well, my name is Davies, and I do have ancestors who come back this way and mine and stock. So, you know, this is, this is our history, brothers and sisters. Our ancestors most probably may have been part of those Phoenician trading um, um, kind of networks of old. And you'll find there silver, iron, tin, and lead. Well, you won't find the silver, but as I say, the silver is from the lead mines as well. So you've got all of them there being mined in Roman times. I could keep going on. This is a massive cauldron they found full of bronze. And, and bronze, of course, you need tin to make and copper. And that was found um, there in 1932. There's some, you can find all these tin ingots. You know, they put the ingots together in order to trade. That one there is in Cornwall, thought to date from 2000 BC. This one's interesting. They found this over in in Germany, this is what they call the Nebra sky disk, and it's thought that they, the ancients used this ancient sky disk to work out when to plant their crops. Anyway, it's made of metal, and um, fascinatingly, when they did the analysis on this metal, they found some of it was tin. Bear in mind, this is in, in Germany, and when they analyze it, tin from the Bronze Age, look where it came from, from Cornwall. And you're telling me that there's no trade going on between the Mediterranean and Britain in the Bronze Age. Well, look at this evidence, brothers and sisters. What about the, um, the more other shipwrecks they found, where they found tons and tons of tin ingots? Well, say tons and tons. They found 44 tin ingots in this one um, off, a, off the coast in 1991 down there in the south. Why have you got 44 tin ingots in your ancient Bronze Age vessel? Well, Britain didn't need the tin. We, there were mines in Cornwall producing it all over the place. It's to trade with the Mediterranean, as the Bible has indicated Tarshish was doing. This one here, 259 copper ingots and 27 tin ingots were discovered near Salcombe. And, and all of these, by the way, they were appeared in the British Archaeology magazine. Um, and in that magazine, you could see the displays that they put, they've put on in the Dover Museum around these things. Look at the artifacts. This is all from the Bronze Age, tin artifacts. This was an industrial scale trade that was going on. All of this was found in the sea. Imagine the stuff that got through and was traded into these areas. And when we go back to the east, this is the Periplus of the Etrian Sea by a sailor around 30 AD. A Periplus is kind of like a list of what was being traded um, from different ports at that time. Interestingly, tin is mentioned four times, but only as an 
import. There were no ports in the east exporting tin. Tin didn't come from the east in the ancient times. It came from the west. Where did it come from? Well, here's old Herodotus again. 440 BC, he said this. Of that part of Europe nearest to the west, I am not able to speak with decision. I by no means believe that the barbarians give the name Endorus Eridanus. I always get stuck with that one. Eridanus to a river which empties itself into the northern sea, whence, as it is said, our amber comes. And this is the point. Neither am I better acquainted with the islands called the Cassiterides, from which we are said to have our tin. It is nevertheless certain that both our tin and our amber are brought from those extreme regions. Now, Herodotus was an educated man. You can read of him going all over the place. He traveled quite extensively. Um, you, can, you can find maps like this online, which is basically the world according to Herodotus. These are the places that he was fully aware of, and he documented in his work the histories of Herodotus. And isn't it funny that Herodotus said, wherever I get our tin from, wherever we get it from, I don't quite know where it is, it's in the far west. And so it fits, doesn't it? He says it's a group of islands called the Cassiterides, the Isles of Tin. Now, Herodotus was aware of Spain, okay? Iberia, he called it. He was aware of the Pillars of Hercules. He was aware of Turkey. He, he, he travelled around there. But he says... The tin didn't come from anywhere there. I don't actually know where it came from. It came from these extreme western regions. He was unsure. I wonder why he was unsure. Well, Strabo, another ancient historian, gives us some clues as to why it was that it wasn't popular knowledge where this tin came from. The Cassiterides are ten in number, says Strabo, and, the, and lie near each other in the ocean. Of the metals, they have tin and lead, Formerly the Phoenicians alone from Gades engrossed this market, hiding the navigation from all others. When the Romans followed a certain shipmaster that they might discover the market, the jealous shipmaster willfully stranded his vessel on a shoal, misleading those who were tracking him to the same destruction. Escaping from the shipwreck by means of a fragment of the ship, he was indemnified for his losses out of the public treasury. So here we have a historical account but it was hard to know where the Cassiterides ever were because the Phoenicians, Hiram, he was the king of the Phoenicians, or at least the ones in Tyre, the Phoenicians alone had gone there and they were hiding it from the other ancient peoples around like the Romans. And by the time the Romans eventually get to Britain, Julius Caesar in his diaries records that tin was already in full production by the time he got there. So is Britain a source of silver, iron, tin and lead? And was it doing, trading those things and making those things in ancient times, I think we can say it was. And by those historical accounts, it seems that it's very clear that that was the, the source of the ancient tin. What about taking over from Tyre, as in the prophecy of Isaiah? Well, it's true, is it not, that, that the British Empire came along and developed and took over trade, dominated trade in the east and in the west like the ancient Phoenicians did. You know, they, um, the East India Trading Company, famous for its dominance in the East of its trade. And so I personally believe that's the answer to the prophecy that says that after Tyre would fall, the ancient power of Tyre would pass over to Tarshish. Finally, let's get to the latter days. Trading power in the Gulf. Well, what's going on at the moment? We've just had Brexit, haven't we? And that's opened up a whole new world of trade for Britain. And who's desperate to get some of that trade? Well, we have the Gulf states. The Gulf Cooperation Council is, is making all the right noises. It wants to do business with Britain. It's already doing a ton of business with Britain at the moment, but it wants to do more. This was... Um, Dr. Liam Fox, obviously the, the new Secretary of State for International Trade. Where was he last week? He was in the Gulf. And he's there visiting Qatar, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. And he's calling for greater trade connections. They're already doing a lot of trade, brothers and sisters, but they want more. 
What about Boris? Good old Boris. Who doesn't like Boris Johnson? He's funny. Or well, he was over in um, um, in the United Nations summit in New York this week, wasn't he? And if you read your papers very carefully, who's he having lunch with? Who's he having little shenanigans with? Rubbing shoulders with? Well, he's talking to those in Bahrain. He's trying to do a little bit of early business. And you say, well, is Britain really in the Gulf? Are they able to challenge this northern invader coming to take a spoil? Well, they're taking a lead, brothers and sisters, we're reading, in terms of the Gulf. The Royal Navy's over there. They have an operation called Operation Kippian. I don't know if you've heard of that. Operation Kippian is, is all about the mission to keep the Gulf waters safe so that trade can take place between Britain and the United, well, and, and the Gulf states. And look what they say on their website under Operation Kippian, ensuring the safe flow of trade and oil in the area. We read in our Bibles that Tarshish will be in the Gulf, and then we look at what Britain is doing, and they're in the Gulf, they're trading, and they've even got, they're not the, the greatest military might, are they? they? They're there enough to challenge these things. And are they a colonial power having independent offspring? Well, we're hearing an awful lot at the moment, aren't we, about the Commonwealth and how important that's going to be to post-Brexit Britain. Trade will be continuing. We've read that it's the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions that will be in Sheba and Dedan. And again, we could spend time looking at all of the young lions, as it were, the independent political offspring who are jumping at the opportunity to start doing business post-Brexit. So again, as we say, we think we've got that clue also hitting the target. They're a descendant of Japheth. They're a maritime power. They traded in global markets. They're located to the west of Israel. They're a source of silver, iron, tin, and lead. They take over from Tyre. They're a trading power in the Gulf. They are a colonial power in the latter days. Brothers and sisters, Britain, I would suggest to you, is the only fit for this power of Tarshish, both historically and currently. What does it mean, brothers and sisters? We're in Ezekiel 38. What are all these things indicating? Leading towards, look at verse 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. Ezekiel 38 is a snapshot of all the nations just before the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself on the world stage. Time is running out, brothers and sisters. The pieces of the puzzle are coming together. Why is Tarshish mentioned so much? Well, God has a purpose with this power called Tarshish. He's, he's written about it in his word. Here in Isaiah 11, we read of those, some famous passages that we're looking and longing forward to. It says there that they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah and the, from the four corners of the earth. Because after the Lord Jesus Christ has returned and the battle of Armageddon has taken place in Ezekiel 38, what is the point of all that, brothers and sisters? It's so that God will be known and the kingdom will be restored again to Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of his father David. It's not just any fuzzy old kingdom, is it? It's a specific kingdom, an Israeli kingdom, regathered, reborn with the Lord Jesus Christ as its head. The first dominion that then spreads to cover the whole earth. And the primary people in that kingdom are to be the Israelites, the Jews who are gathered in, aren't they, to be the subjects under the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see there from Isaiah. And the nation, we are told, that is going to help do that is the power of Tarshish. I'll show you a verse about that in a minute. I don't know if you can see the screen very well, but that's a passage there from Isaiah 2. Again, a latter-day prophecy. And it says that in the time when 
the law is going to go forth from Zion, that's the kingdom age, we read that the lofty people, the proud people are going to be brought low and humbled in that day. And you know who's singled out to be humble, brothers and sisters? The Tarshish power. Oh yes, they're alive and well when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, but they have to be humble. And so something has to change in this proud and lofty nation that we, that we reside in as strangers and pilgrims. Tarshish has to be humbled. And we read then, it seems that when they are humbled and the sign is set up in Israel of Christ, we read in Isaiah 66 that God will set up a sign among the Jews. And we think that's Christ. And I will send those that escape of them Jews unto the nations, to Tarshish, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles, and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto Yahweh, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. And so it seems to be that, that the Jews, they go back to some of these countries, possibly the saints with them as well. When the Lord Jesus Christ has returned, and they educate the people around, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ has returned. And one of the things that he's looking to do is establish the kingdom of Israel. And so one of the things that they do is they get all the Jews on their ships, as it were, and they bring them to Christ, to Jerusalem. And Tarshish, we read there, is their first, it says in Isaiah 60. Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first. To bring thy sons from far, thy silver and thy gold with them, unto the name of Yahweh thy God, unto the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. What a change, brothers and sisters, in this nation. What a change. Imagine that. Imagine going down the street and, and talking to someone and saying, hey, heard it. They say, yes, oh, God is glorified. The Israelites, we have no idea that there is this great plan and purpose. So we're helping. We're helping to, to bring those Jews back. And the knowledge of God will be in this earth. I'm sorry if I had to whiz through that. We're running way over time. And I'm sorry for that. But I just wanted to make the point. That we can't treat God's word lightly. Can we? Particularly in relation to these things. Tarshish is a real power. We can't just be like, well, it's anyone. It's very specific. God has revealed these things to us. We're his people. We're his saints. Let's treat God's word with reverence, and let's seek to understand what God has said. And as I say, the best fit, as I can see, for the Tarshish Tower is this Tower of Britain that we live in. It is reasonable, more than reasonable, I suggest, that Britain is ancient Tarshish. And so what are the implications for you and me? Well, the implications are simple. Because we have just witnessed the detachment of the Tarshish Tower from the powers of Goma and Mago in Brexit. And this should make us think, shouldn't it, brothers and sisters? How long is there to go? There's hardly any time at all. This is a great sign for us. This is a time for us to pull up our socks, to look at how we're spending our time, and to consider the fact that God has called us out of the Gentiles to be a people for his name. We've witnessed Brexit, brothers and sisters. What more do we need to give us the kick that we need to get things correct in our lives? The Lord Jesus Christ is coming, brothers and sisters. Are we ready? The earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. 
Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.